Could you start off by talking us through what you mean by water stress? I mean, could you give us an idea of how long the 17 countries worst affected have before demand outstrips supply? Yeah, thank you for having me and happy to explain water stress a little bit better. Water stress is a ratio of water demand divided by total water supply. And literature shows that if this ratio exceeds 40 or 80 percent, there is a risk of running into conflict or a dire situation in times of drought. And how did we find ourselves in this situation with, uh, in your report that you helped to author, 61 countries ranked as having extremely high or high water stress? Yeah, so um, we looked at the, at the world's and the historical data, and we found that demand is the main driver of the global water stress. In fact, humankind is 250%, so two and a half more, thirstier than it was in the 1960s. And we looked at different sectors for water withdrawal, water demand, and that includes irrigated agriculture. That's the biggest one at approximately 70%, but also industry and domestic water withdrawals are, are up. And your report, does it have any recommendations for, for governments? I mean, what would you say is its main message to governments worldwide? Yeah, that's, that's a great question as well. Uh, we looked at baseline water stress, and it's the most used proxy for uh, water-related stress situations. However, it's not your destiny, we call it. So there are a lot of examples of hope. Um, the, the outlook of water stress really depends on the management. And even countries with relatively high water stress have effectively secured their water supplies through proper management. And we have three examples, but there are more than three examples. One is Saudi Arabia. It's ranked number eight in terms of water stress in our rankings, but they price water to incentivize conservation. And this new katra, it means droplet in Arabic program, sets water cons conservation targets and aim to reduce water usage by 43% within the next decade. And then Namibia is the second example. It's one of the most arid countries in the world, but yet it has uh, turned sewage water into drinking water and it has done so for the last 50 years. And then the third example is Australia, where nearly half the domestic water use um, during the millennium drought and uh, they're using a water trading scheme. It's in fact the largest in the world, and it allows for smart allocation of water among users in the face of variable supplies. So you mentioned there what you, what you could call some good students, but overall, would you say that uh, countries worldwide are taking this issue seriously enough? Uh, unfortunately not. I think our relationship with water worldwide needs, to, uh, needs a rethinking. That is a topic for another uh, for another time, like we we now investigated how big the problem is. We investigate a few trends and a few pockets of hope. Uh, in terms of solutions, uh, we can think of multiple ways to address the issue. Uh, as mentioned before, approximately 70% of the withdrawal worldwide is for irrigated agriculture. So there is a lot to gain there. So increasing agricultural efficiency would be uh, the number one option on the solution shortlist. And then second, when uh, demand increases, whereas supply stays constant or even the variability increases due, due to climate change, uh, we need to use all the tools in our toolbox to um, save water when there is a surplus, when there's a flood, and we need to get water from reservoirs or wetlands when there when there is a drought. So really, we call it green and gray infrastructure, where you really take uh, both solutions when it comes to building reservoirs, but also uh, forests and uh, replenishing groundwater. And then the last um, item on the, on the menu of solutions is to really think of wastewater as used water that can be a source uh, to use again. So treat it, reuse it, and recycle wastewater.